Are you ready? Hello, and welcome to the Whole House Podcast, where you can find home, health, and family all in one place. Our team is comprised of moms from different upbringings and backgrounds, and we each have different passions and giftings and strengths. We each represent a different room, and we all make up the whole house. So grab a cup of coffee and join our overly caffeinated ladies here for the Whole House Podcast. Okay, and one more, one more thing I want to say, one more announcement is that, you know, there are babies here and people are going to breastfeed and we are totally fine with that and Gabe needs to really keep that on the podcast because <laughs> our editor, that would be awesome. We are totally fine with nursing babies. Like, That's. I can guarantee you, almost every podcast we have put out, there has been a baby nurse. Yeah. Yes. yes. That I can guarantee you. Because there's a lot of babies. Okay. So I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to start by asking you some questions. And first of all, if you look at my notebook and go like, oh my gosh, she's got like 20 pages of notes. I do. But I made the font like 18. So I didn't have to worry if I lost my glasses. So there you go. All of those who have to wear glasses for reading are laughing hilariously right now. And they're like, yeah, I get it. I even did my scriptures in 24 font. So I wouldn't mess up any of the words. <laughs> Except for those, sorry. That didn't fit on the card that way. Okay. I like to be a little bit interactive. So I have done um, a smaller portion of this for some mini retreats I've done for my small group. So if you've been in my small group, you know when I ask a question, I really do want an answer. So when I ask a question, if you want to answer, just shout it out. So, here's your first question. What's the last decision you made completely uninfluenced by others or your circumstances? What I wore this morning. I was going to say that. What I wore this morning. I just, I wanted to wear this skirt, so I wore it. I didn't. It's beautiful. Yes. So, I, the reason I asked you that question is we make so many decisions because of what others think of us or what our circumstances are at the time. For example, if you know that there's no money in your bank account, then you might feel like you can't enjoy your life, period. And that's just not true. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So here's another question. Do your circumstances define you or confine you in any way? I see the gears turning. So even if you don't have an answer right now, which is what I told told my small group because they had the same look on their face. They're like, you can see the wheels turning. Like, wait, I don't know what that means. You will know what that means by the time I'm finished talking. And then you will have answers. Okay, go ahead, Linda. Right. Yep. Like me, yes, like I have a job, so I can do only so much, but what I can do, I can make it possible. Exactly. Okay, I don't need to do that. No. <laughs> okay, so here's a really good one, and this is one you, you should sit down and think about for a while. If you had total freedom from other people's opinions or your current circumstances, and your erroneous beliefs, like those lies that you believe, what would your life look like? So I'm not expecting you guys to shout out answers. I want you to think about it. What would your life look like? Would it be different than it is right now? I know mine would. I mean, no matter how much I think I've arrived, there's so, which I haven't, by the way, at all, so don't be thinking that, there's so much more that I need to have revelation on. There are so many things that I need to let go. There are so many myths that I believe, so many lies that I believe. Even when I think I don't believe them anymore, they just seem to pop back up. So, <clears throat> Kathleen, will you repeat the three things? Because sure. I'll just read the whole thing. Okay. If you had total freedom from others' opinions, your current circumstances, your erroneous beliefs about yourself, and opinions about others. So opinions, circumstances, beliefs. 
There you go. And here's the last one I'm going to ask you. What if you walked as if you were truly loved, truly loved, truly loved, cherished and valued? What if you saw yourself like Jesus sees you? I'm not talking about just having self-esteem, which Jessica's going to talk about in her workshop, based on yourself. I'm talking about having value because God said you had value. What would your life look like? Would it look differently? And I think that this is something that we grow incrementally in. We don't just have one big revelation like, okay, I'm done. I know I'm valuable. I know I'm loved. I know I'm cherished. So I will shine. No, we get little glory by glory is what God said. We learn glory by glory. We make progress a little bit at a time. So you can be thinking about those questions as I get into the lesson. Modern feminism tells us that we can have it all and that we should have it all. That's the message of modern feminism. You can have the job, you can have the kids, you can have the life, you can have the car, you can have the money, you can have everything. But if we have it all, we can't expect that there aren't going to be consequences for having it all. Because if we have it all, we have to take care of it all. So it's not possible to have it all materially and not have consequences because mathematically and scientifically, I'm not going to talk about Fibonacci sequences or anything, team, but the scientific rule is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when we tell ourselves that we have to do it all, we have to have it all, we have to be it all, then we're going to have to pay in some way for that. And as my stepfather Bud used to say, something's got to give. He used to tell me that in college. I would get so overwhelmed in college, like staying up half the night, which I'm not very good at. I've never been good at staying up past 8 o'clock my whole life. Ask my kids, <laughs> like, you guys are going to bed at 7 because I have to be in bed by 8. <laughs> I never, and so just trying to manage college and studying and family relationships. And I remember being at my sister's house, and she wasn't in college anymore, and she was doing my hair. And the whole time she's doing my hair, I felt like I wanted to rip it out because I was so stressed about what I had to do for school. And, and my stepfather, Bud, said to me, something's got to give right now, and it's probably going to be you, unless you change the way you see things and what you're doing and how you handle things. And we call those coping mechanisms. We have to get coping mechanisms. So I'll just give you a really simple example of having it all. Some people would really love to have a pool, but they don't want to have to vacuum it. They don't want to have to put the chemicals in it, clean off the patio, and do all those things that you have to do. So if you have a pool, you have to maintain a pool. And if you don't maintain it, it turns green. Just like those weeks it got really cold and nobody was swimming in my pool. And then Hunter woke up one morning and he said, Mom, the pool is green. I'm like, oh, yes it is. So that's just a simple, simple lesson. Um, have you ever heard of urban woman syndrome? It's a new syndrome. There's always new syndromes coming out. This is Dr. Viller. She wrote a book about it. She says that women are paying a hefty price for having it all and doing it all because the stressors in our lives are greater than they were in our mother's times. And here's an amazing and scary fact. Women are 75% more likely to develop an autoimmune disorder. Because this is why, scientifically, this is not about feminism, this is about science. Men's bodies react differently to today's current stressors than women's bodies do. Now, does that mean we're just supposed to sit in a corner and just say, I can't get stressed, I can't get stressed. By the way, that won't work, tried it. <laughs> just sit at home and never do anything ever again. That does not work. It just means we need to examine our lives and we need to learn how to thrive instead of just be in survival mode. 
So whether you work or stay at home and work, the pressure is greater than any other time in history to have it all together in a world that is falling apart. There's more pressure to look perfect for our social media-driven world. Just get on Instagram. There's more pressure because we have the freedom now to get a college degree and have a career. There's more pressure to find the perfect career for you. And there's a lot of pressure because I know, you know, my kids went to college, and when they're going to college, they're getting all this pressure about find the job that makes the most money instead of find the job that makes you feel happy, fulfilled, and feel like you have a purpose. So there's a lot of pressure. And, and then the opposite. If you stay home and you homeschool, then there's that pressure that, oh, because you homeschool, everything in your home is perfect because you have the time to organize everything. It should be perfectly decorated. You should have maps on the wall. It should look like a schoolroom. No, it's, that's not the way it is. There's so much pressure no matter what path you choose. And we, the thing is, if you get it all together, something's going to happen and it's all going to fall apart again. And I'm not trying to be a downer. I will get to the up part, but right now let's examine. And so I even wrote on here, are you feeling pressure just hearing this? Like, have I taken you down to the bottom rung? Because if I have, then we can start to go up. So what happens when we are under this overwhelming stress of urban woman syndrome is we get into survival mode. I teach a lot about this in Empowered to Connect training with kids who have come from hard places. Survival mode is fight, flight, or freeze. And so those can look different when you're an adult because hopefully if you're in fight, you're not falling on the ground, having a fit, kicking and screaming. Fight will look a little bit different for us when we're older. We will physically get into screaming matches or we will unfriend everybody or we will just like, I just can't deal with this right now. We just kind of, that's our fight. We fight differently. I don't know how you fight, but we all fight differently. Or flight, which is what I was talking about before. Sometimes we flight and we isolate ourselves because we're just like, I'm not going to deal with the world. I'll just stay at home in my pajamas, and then I can hide, and then I don't have to worry about it. Lori, are you smiling? You're back there laughing. Okay. And then freeze. What we say with kids who freeze, it looks differently. It can be look, kids can look like they've checked out. And um, they can also be goofy. Those kids are the ones who are the class clown. So we can also do that as adults. Instead of facing our issues and talking about what's really going on, we just make other people laugh. We do that as adults, and they were just like, okay, I don't want to deal with my issues. I'll just be the fun person to be around, and everybody will like being around me. But then you go home, and you're depressed and upset and unmotivated because you haven't dealt with those things. So going down a little further, we're not to the bottom rung yet. So as soon as we get one step closer to, I've got it all covered, got all my ducks in a row, then circumstances happen and throw us into the pit. Divorce, depression, job loss, parenting a child with special needs, a move, a job change, a new baby, health issues, the death of a loved one, or fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. You can be sailing along for like a whole hour and think, I got it all together. And I, I was joking with my husband one night. I said, I think that we should do like a podcast on how having a large family prepares you for crises because you have one after another after like, okay, that one has an emergency app, appendectomy one week and then the next week it's somebody else and then the next week it's somebody else. It's like boom, 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 boom. And honestly... There was a time in my life, and sometimes I go back there and stay there for a little while, and then I come back out. That, those circumstances had me like this all the time. Like, oh, 
okay, that one's out of the hospital. We're all good. And poof. And I would bottom out emotionally and then back up and then bottom out. And like I said, I'm not perfect. I still go there. But we have to get to a new place of thriving. So when those things happen, then everything kind of looks gray. Like our circumstances look gray. We feel gray. And so if you are there, you are not alone. We all have seasons in our life where we just live there. And so that's why I really had it on my heart to talk about learning how to thrive and not just survive. So <clears throat> so there's three things that I need reminded of often, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I learned them from John 5, the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda, and also from Holly Girth via her book, You're Going to Be Okay. I highly recommend that book. It's called You're Going to Be Okay. And I read that in a, at a time in my life, um, probably four or five years ago, where I thought, I am not going to be okay. <laughs> and I picked up that book at a conference that she spoke at, and I thought, uh, this, I need to read this because I don't feel like I'm okay at all. So I have in 24 font <laughs> the story, but we're going to John 5, chapter 1, if you want to look it up and follow along. If you don't, I'm not offended at all. I'll just read it. Later on, there was a Jewish festival or feast for which Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem a pool near the Sheep Gate. This pool in Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches, alcoves, colonnades, or doorways. In these lay a great number of sick folk, some blind, some crippled, and some paralyzed, shriveled up, waiting for the bubbling of the water. I'm reading Amplified, by the way, because I like how it defines things. For an angel of the Lord went down at an appointed season into the pool and moved and stirred up the water. Whoever was then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in and was cured of whatever disease in which he was afflicted. There was a certain man, this is the man we're going to talk about today, who had suffered with a deep-seated and lingering disorder for 38 years. Now, I used to read this and really judge this man. I think really 38 years until God gave me a revelation. How many things have I suffered and hung on to for 38 years? Now, some of you are not 38 yet, so you, <laughs> you have an excuse. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to find this man. I'm going to say, we are emotional siblings, dude. Because I understand why you had a deep-seated and lingering disorder. If you notice, the other people, some were paralyzed and shriveled up. But he had a deep-seated and lingering disorder. Those are two different things. For 38 years. When Jesus noticed him lying there, helpless, knowing that he had already been a long time in that condition. I think that's hilarious. Knowing that he had already been a long time in that condition, 38 years. Like, Jesus is funny sometimes, really. <laughs> he is funny. Like, he knew. God knew. And listen to what he said to him. Okay, I'm going to say what I think I probably would say to him before I read what Jesus said to him. I would say, man, I feel so sorry for you. Can I get you a sandwich? <laughs> you know, I feel bad for you. This is stinks. I can't imagine being in the condition that you have been in for 38 years. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus did not even say, hey, I feel bad for you. This is what he said. Do you want to become well? That was what Jesus asked him. There's a story behind that question. There's a story that we have to ask ourselves behind that question. Are you really in earnest at getting well? Do you want healing? Do you want to be better? Or are you comfortable in the conditions that you're in? The invalid answered, Sir, I imagine an Eeyore voice. I can't do an Eeyore voice. <laughs> I have nobody when the water is moving to put me in the pool. 
But while I am trying to come into it myself, somebody steps ahead of me. How often do we do that? I'm going to tell a little story here about Moira, <laughs> Amory's middle daughter, who is only two. They have this. You may have seen it on Facebook. They have this little play place in their backyard. Moira tried to get into a circle that she was not intended to get in, and she got her butt stuck. So she was stuck there yelling, Mama, I stuck, I stuck. How often do we not yell, Dear God, I am stuck. I am stuck. No, instead we say, There is nobody to help me. So I'm just going to lie here for another 38 years. <laughs> and listen to what Jesus said to him in response to that. He didn't say, I feel bad for you. He didn't say that stinks. He didn't say you shouldn't have put your butt in that circle. <laughs> he said, get up. Get up. Sometimes that's what we need to hear. We need to hear. We need to have a friend say to us. We need to have a family member say to us. We need someone to say to us, get up. Get up. And take up your bed and walk. That's what Jesus said to him. Instantly, the man became well and recovered his strength and picked up his bed and walked. But that happened on the Sabbath. So I'm going to skip to verse 14. Afterward, so the man walks, walks away, he goes to the temple. Afterward, when Jesus found him in the temple, he said to him, See, you are well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And now I'm going to skip to verse 17 because I think this one is really important. And there's a song that we've been singing at church that I sing over and over and over again that has to do with this verse. But Jesus answered them, my father has worked even until now. He has never ceased working. He is still working. And I, too, must be at divine work. It's a song we sing, The Waymaker. He's still working. Even when we can't see it, he's working. God is always working on our behalf, even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't see it. So we're going to start with a first point, which is first, do you want to get well? That's what Jesus asked the man. Like I said, when I ask a question, I'm waiting for an answer. Do you want to get well? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> you guys all get a gold star. Okay. So if you think, think of it this way, Jesus addressed his heart first. There was a heart issue first. I'm not saying the man didn't need physical healing. He obviously did. But he addressed his heart first. In Bethesda, which translates house of mercy, people gathered at the pool of water. The sick came to get well. And Jesus asks us that same question. He doesn't say, I feel so sorry for you. You have deep-seated illnesses here. Maybe you have a fear bossing you around. Maybe you have circumstantial depression, and it's getting you down. Do you want to get well? You know, often in our Christian circles, we approach someone, we're just like, you know, we're just going to pray in Jesus' name that you get healed. Jesus didn't outright approach this man and heal him. He didn't declare him healed in his name because he knew he had to start with that question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? So that can be interpolated into whatever your circumstances are today. Now I'll give you an example of a story from my life. Some people do not want to get well. I have some autoimmune disorders, diseases, and I go to a specialist in Pittsburgh. And I was going through a series of IV treatments. Um, this has been a long time ago. And I had to go in every two weeks and get an IV treatment. And... <clears throat> they were working. I was starting to feel better. And every time I went into the doctor, I had to fill out all these forms, put all these numbers on, and what percentage of 
life I felt like I was being able to live. And when I got up to like 70%, the doctor said, you know, how are you doing? Are you doing more out, out, out of your house and being able to just get back into your life? And I said, yeah, I, I am, and I love it. I think it's amazing. I'm so excited. I'm so thankful that you have helped me so much. And he said, well, I'm asking you that question because a lot of my patients don't want to get well because they are so addicted to the sympathies. They're so addicted to the lifestyle that they have created for themselves with people waiting on them, feeling sorry for them, doing things for them, that they actually don't want to get well. So that, to me, that was just like, what? <laughs> that was astounding to me. But I do know that I cannot be hypocritical there have been areas in my life that I didn't want to get well. There are certain things in my life that I haven't wanted to change. But when I did begin to let the Holy Spirit work with me and change them, then it was for the better. So we do hold on to things. So do you want to be healed of your fear, your complacency, your worry, your bad attitude, and find a free, abounding, abundant life? Because Jesus said this thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's Satan. Steal, kill, destroy. All of those words are like war. Those are war words. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Just not that you have a pulse. I have a pulse until I die and then it's over. No. Abundant. He wants you to have an abundant life. That doesn't mean free from frustration. That doesn't mean free from circumstances that we don't like. But we can live an abundant life during those circumstances. So, do you want this new thing? <clears throat> and I believe that Jesus asks us this. Insert your name here. You say you want this, but do you really want radical passion and purpose? How many of us want radical passion and purpose? You guys all get a gold star, too. I give myself a gold star. I want to just dispel a myth. You know, here they are at the pool, and he's saying, no one helped me in. There is enough pool water for everybody. There is enough Jesus for everybody. When you're sitting here or you're sitting in church and you look at the person next to you and you think they're telling you all these wonderful things that God has done for them and you're thinking, uh, he hasn't done anything for me, then here's a new attitude. Thank you, Lord, that you bless them because that means you can bless me because there is enough pool water for everyone. There is enough blessing for everyone. There is enough abounding life for everyone, abundant life for everyone. There's not just a measured amount, and it's like, oh, we gave that much to Megan, and we gave that much to... It's all... It's done. We used it all up. No, it doesn't work that way at all. So when we listen to what this man says, just, sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anyone to put me in the pool. That's a mindset when we have that mindset, there's no, God doesn't care about me. There's no one here for me. I don't have any friends. That's a mindset. And when we have that mindset, what's really amazing about the brain, here's some more science for you. Whenever you get a mindset and you have a thought pattern that you think over and over and over again, when it's negative, it will grow what looks like a toxic tree in your brain, and it's toxic. So that means every time that you begin to think that thought pattern, that tree is activated, and will, it will actually put hormones into your body, like cortisol, and put them in your body because of your thoughts. But here's another amazing thing about the brain. Once you change your mindset, and it's, you know, people have told us it takes 21 days to create a habit. It takes three cycles of 21 days, 63 days to change a mindset. We call that in the Bible a stronghold. So if you think you read that word in the Bible, a stronghold, oh my gosh, we don't have like a fortress. We don't have a stone wall and <laughs> swords. And A stronghold is simply a mindset that you've had for over 63 days. 
So you can actually do the opposite. When you start thinking with a fresh, new, positive mindset based on the word, not just fluff, then you will actually start growing a healthy tree and the toxic tree will begin to die. The more you grow this healthy tree, you can look it up. Dr. Caroline Leaf, she has pictures of brain scans showing this. And so the, the negative toxic tree will begin to die and the healthy tree will begin to grow. So then when you begin to think that positive thought, it becomes an automatic. Has anybody ever heard of automatic thoughts? We have the automatic thoughts that come to us because of our nurture and our nature. It's just like if you smell cinnamon, there's an apple pie. You know, that's an automatic thought. And then you're looking for the apple pie. So we can begin to form automatic <coughs> thoughts that are a positive, a mindset. Well, this is a circumstance that is happening to me. It is not me. I am loved by God. I am cherished. I am a daughter of the king. Grow that tree. Grow that tree. Grow that. This one dies. But here's, here's the sad part about it. If you've grown this tree this big and it's doing great, and then automatically you have a couple bad days, toxic tree just starts to come back up. So it's work. You know, the Bible says we need to renew our mind. That's why. It's like washing the dishes. You've got to do it every single day. If you don't, the dishes are going to pile up or the negative tree is going to pop up. So, so we've said yes to getting well. So now we have to get up. This is what we have to do. And just like I said, your circumstances don't define you. They are not who you are. And what this looks like when we let them define you is we say, I am sick, I am poor, I am divorced, I am lonely. Then we're letting those circumstances define us and confine us instead of saying, this is happening to me. I am going through a divorce, and it stinks, but it is not who I am. I hardly have any money in my bank account, but I am still loved and cherished, and God is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And you start saying those things, and they automatically come out. And in the last session, we're actually going to practice doing those, saying the word out loud. So <clears throat> when the enemy tries to whisper to us whenever we struggle is this. This is what the enemy tells us when we're struggling. If God really loved you, this wouldn't be happening. Does everybody agree with that? Do you ever hear that in your brain? Like, if God really loved me, this wouldn't happen. That is not true. That is a lie. Things do not, your circumstances do not define you, and you should not let them confine you. Okay? The world has sickness. It has sin. It has suffering. Those things happen. Those are not God throwing lightning bolts at us. I used to think that. In fact, I remember doing a vision board for the character of God, and I must have been in a really deep, dark place because I used all this stuff from with Gandalf and the uh, just some really deep, dark, dark stuff. I put like a wizard on the board and fire and all this stuff. And I was showing my, I had to do this for my counselor. She wanted me to do a vision board. She's like, what does God look like to you? That's what he looked like to me. There was a seed in my life that I thought God was up there throwing lightning bolts down at me. Like this, okay, this. And that because I had a, I did not have a very great beginning in my life. And I was letting that define me. And I won't get into that, but I let that confine me. So <clears throat> don't believe what that man believed, that you're not loved, that you're not cherished. Those are lies. You are infinitely loved. God loved you and thought of you before the foundation of the world. So one of your tables has Ephesians 1. Who is going to read that one? A verse from, Okay. Consecrated and set apart for him, and 
blameless in his sight, even above reproach, before him in love. For he foreordained us, destined us, planned in love for us, to be adopted, revealed, as his own children through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the purpose of his will, because it pleased him and his and was his kind intent. Thank you. I've written that scripture down so many times, and I use that scripture when I teach about adoption and foster care, because adoption was God's idea. It's right there. Before he created the, the world, before he set the foundation down, he chose you. He actually picked each one of you. Don't think, oh, it's just a person next to me, or it's just my neighbor, or it's just my grandmother because she prays a lot. He actually picked you out, you he chose you. He loves you. He adopted you into his family because it was his kind intent. So the next time you're thinking, I got nobody, remember, God already chose you. He already picked you. You know, um, I don't know if you guys had this in gym class where they would pick the team captains and the team captains would pick their team. I was always the one picked last because I was a scrawny little freckle-faced kid who had I was not very coordinated that was my sister she was the gymnast she was amazing and she could do anything on any piece of equipment parallel bars I mean parallel bars everything not me but you were not picked last and I was not picked last you were picked first before the foundation of the world so that is a way that we get up we remember who we are in Christ not who we are by ourselves, because I'm nothing by myself. In fact, every time I'm going to do a workshop or anything, I say, God, if you don't show up, I'm in big trouble. So please be there, and he is here. Okay. So we have another scripture, Romans 8, 38 and 39. Who has that one? I do. Okay. For I am persuaded beyond doubt, I am sure, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things impending and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is amazing. I mean, nothing, I mean, we know from the first verse in Ephesians 1 that we are chosen and that we are loved. Now we are reminded that nothing can separate us from that love. Whether we're lying at the pool waiting for an angel to stir the waters, we are still loved. This man was still loved. We are still loved. No matter what kind of circumstances you have, they don't define you. Your circumstances are not you. You are loved, you are cherished, and you have a purpose. So here's another important point, because women like tend to be emotional myself included okay we can go like this and our husbands are standing there going what (laughs) what what was that (laughs) like my husband would not stop teasing me last night about the Fibonacci sequence when we were setting up he was here helping and he put two things of flowers down I said you can't do that it's not part of the Fibonacci sequence he has not let me live that down it's like no it's mathematically important I've never heard of it either what is that it's a sequence found in nature, like in pine cones, flowers. Um, it's a mathematical sequence. I have a math degree, okay? <laughs> yes, and it's one, three, five, seven. So when you are doing decorating, you use one, three, but you never put two flowers. There's got to be one, or three, or five, or seven. Okay, there's your little design lesson for the day and your math lesson. <laughs> I'll come over. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh. you have a math lesson. After all. <laughs> <laughs> I am a homeschool mom, so I can't. I never will outgrow that. So, if you you are not what you feel, if you feel overwhelmed, stressed, or like a failure, those are feelings. And as we know, as women, feelings come and go. 
we can be really excited about something that we signed up to do and then the event day comes or whatever or you signed up to work in the nursery and you're so excited and then the day comes and you're back there in the nursery and all the kids are crying and then you're like what why did I sign up for this so our feelings change but they are not who you are so this is those are the times that we have to step back and encourage ourselves in the Lord with the scriptures that we were just talking about. Like I said, we'll go we'll actually do that later today. Hide them in your heart. Write them down, make them part of your arsenal. Stick them on the mirror or in your kitchen over your sink. Stick them places you will see them. So <clears throat> Pull out the weapon of the word, and I have a very interesting story about the word. The Bible is the word of God, and we're supposed to use it. It's in our weapon arsenal. You know, we have the shield of faith. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the belt of truth. We have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have the sword. We have the helmet of salvation, the sword. So I, we were on vacation in South Carolina, and we went to visit... Uh, my brother-in-law and his family, and my nephew, who is a Marine, real tough guy, he also likes to do metalworking just for a hobby. So he makes swords and knives and all that kind of stuff. So he brought in this gorgeous sword, just about that big. It was gold, and it was just beautiful. So he handed it to me, and I about sliced my toe off. That thing was so heavy. It was so heavy. So I'm holding the sword, and he hands it to me. I'm like... Oh, I'm holding the sword, and he's laughing at me, of course. Like I said, he's a Marine. He's like, so he's laughing at me because I can barely hold this sword. So then he starts talking to me about history and how much armor weighed and how much these helmets weighed and these swords weighed that these men are carrying around. And so I listen, you know, I'm really, I'm always interested in history. So... That thought about how heavy the sword was would not leave my mind. I kept thinking about it and thinking about it every day. And then I finally told my sister, I'm like, it just really hit me. The word, the sword, it's heavy. It's hard work to get out your sword. It's hard work to do something what we sometimes in our mind will think is ridiculous, like walk around your house with your sword saying, (laughs) you know, reciting scripture, I am loved, I am chosen, God loves me. But it is hard work because we don't use those muscles. That's why. And the more we use those muscles of using the word, praying the word, speaking the word out loud, my mom became a Christian when I was in junior high. And all of that stuff was really new to her, so she did some strange things, like she used to rebuke us. (laughs) Like if we were doing something that she no longer thought was holy, she would say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But she was learning how to use the tools that we've been given. And one of the tools that we've been given is the sword. And yes, it is hard work to get your Bible out, to actually get your Bible out, Look up scriptures for things that you are dealing with. If you're dealing with anger, don't look up scriptures on prosperity. Look up scriptures about anger. And if you're dealing with not feeling loved, then find every scripture. I mean every scripture that you can. Highlight them. Write them down. It's okay to write in your Bible. It is okay. I know some people struggle with that. Write in your Bible. You can. So, okay. So now... We have our sword. We got up. Now you got to take up your bedroll. And what does this mean? We all make messes with our lives. We have unforgiveness. We stay angry when we shouldn't. We stay in the pit of circumstantial depression. I'm not talking about the kind that you need to be medicated for. We can get in circumstantial depression, and it's just a funk that we need to get out of. We need to make our bed. Some of us need to literally make our bed (laughs) just because it makes us feel better. I'm not telling you that if you go home and make your bed, then all your problems will be solved. But it's just one of those steps in our day that if we make our bed, we feel better. But what's more important is that we make peace 
with all those around us that we can. That doesn't mean we invite them to live in our lives. We can sometimes put up boundaries. If someone is a repeat offender in our lives, we can say, I am not going to be, I'm going to forgive that person, but I'm going to put up some boundaries. You're not going to be at my house on my couch every night. You can be at somebody else's house on somebody else's couch. And here's another thing we do. We fill our calendars to overflowing, and we joke about how overwhelmed we are. Ask somebody when you're out in public, and you say, hey, how you doing? What do they say? I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. And often they don't even have time to stop and chat. We have some friends who have moved here from out of state, And apparently we do a little bit better at that in West Virginia than other states. And they were astounded that when someone came over for dinner that they stayed for three or four hours and played games and chatted. And, yeah, that's how we do that. Well, not where they were from. Where they were from, they were like, okay, thanks for dinner, 15 minutes, got to go, bye. (laughs) So we, we make those choices. Do you need to check that? Okay. And sometimes we live on the outskirts of healing for so long that we feel more comfortable with stress in our lives than we do with peace. Like as as soon as we get a moment of peace, like, oh, my goodness, all the kids are quiet for two seconds. The dishes are done. We have peace. There's something wrong. And sometimes if the kids are quiet, there is something wrong. But I'm talking about something totally different. Sometimes we get into a season of our life where we're feeling blessings. We're like, God is blessing me today. I really got a really close parking spot. Well, that wouldn't be me because ask my kids. I always park way in the back. But, you know, when God is blessing you, you might start to wonder, is there something wrong? Because we get so used to stress and go to this thing, that thing, this thing, this thing, that we feel like stresses are normal. And we need to get out of that mindset. And that's part of picking up your bedroll. Examine your life. Examine what's on your plate. Just because something is good to do doesn't mean it's good for you to do. You have to look at it and say, what kind of fruit is this producing in my life? And what, will, what fruit will it produce 10 years later? For example, sitting down and having a tea party with your kids or your niece or someone in your family because they want to have a tea party, 10 years later, yes, that's fruit. Those kids are going to remember that. Getting on Facebook for three hours and liking everything you see, I don't know. It depends on what you're doing on Facebook. Are you getting in an argument about politics? (laughs) You know, and I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you, think about yourself. Be aware yourself what things stress you more. What things, what is your purpose and your passion, which we'll get to in a minute. So I wrote down a couple things that we should do. We need to remember the feeling of just sitting there and reading a good book for no reason. I've gotten back into reading mysteries. I love to read mysteries, and I have to read at night before I go to bed. But there was a season in my life where I felt like I couldn't do that. Like I had to do something important. So lying on the grass and watching the clouds go by. Or sitting out on the front porch just because. Not to watch your neighbors, but that's fun too. (laughs) Making cookies with your kids just to eat, not for an event. I remember I'd, I would make cookies and my kids would say, where are we going? What's that for? <laughs> are we allowed to eat those? So picking up your mat in a nutshell is taking responsibility for yourself. It's the old adage, you make a mess, you clean it up. That's what we tell our kids. If you are overburdened, overstressed, and your day schedule is maxed out, what can you cut out? You decide. That doesn't mean you can just go quit your job. That's not what I mean. But there are things that we can do for ourselves that make our life a little less stressful. Something as simple as knowing, I know I have to drink a lot of water 
and I'm drinking coconut water because I need the electrolytes when I speak. That's just something really simple. Think about simple things that you can do to relieve your stress during the day. It can be that simple or it can be major. It can be like, I need to re-examine my whole life and look at my schedule and see what I can cut out. You don't have to be on every committee. You don't have to, sir, I love church, don't get me wrong, but you don't have to volunteer for every single thing at church. Even if the person who asks you is really cute and they're smiling and they're like, you want to do this? Come on, you want to do this? And you know inside you're saying, yeah, I've got these other three things on that day, and then you hear yourself saying, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then as soon as you get in the car and you're driving home, you're like, why did I do that? Why? I didn't, I didn't mean to say yes. So, and here is a very extremely important question to ask yourself. Does it have eternal value? Does it have eternal value? Because if it doesn't, then it can be, yeah, I can do that because it's fun, but it's not going to be eternal value and I don't have to do it, but I can do it. Eternal value, investing in relationships, investing in your family, investing in your purpose and your passion. Those are things that have eternal value. So, and here's, here's an important point about what I was saying about volunteering. If you're just working for the Lord and not spending any time with him, then you're not going to reap that connection with God and that relationship with him that you were put on this earth for. We are here to be in relationship with God the Father, Jesus Christ his Son, and yes, our spiritual family and our physical family. But if you're so busy doing, 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 I know because I'm a doer, 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 that you don't stop to be. And that's not very popular in our culture anymore. I mean, try it. When somebody asks you, you know, how are you? What are you doing? Nothing. Just, just look at the look on their face. Just try it. Nothing. I'm just being. I'm just zoning out here. I'm just going to be. We always think of that as like the, the granola chick who never washes her hair and, you know, never ate sugar. In her. Oh, I'm talking about my mom. <laughs> Yep! <laughs> My mom was a woman before her time. She was amazing. All right, let's move on to number three. Start walking. So I told you to be, but we're going to walk too. Each of us has a specific purpose. We do. We're that special. Each of you in this room has a purpose. In fact, you have many, M I N I many M-A-N-Y purposes because we all go through seasons. My purpose right now is not to take care of an infant because I don't have an infant. That season of my life is over. But I have new purposes and new seasons. And I want everybody to do what Jessica advised us this week is just breathe. Take a deep breath. And remember that it's just not all the girls on Instagram that you follow that have a purpose. All the ones who moved everything off their kitchen counters to take that perfect photo and everything behind them is like stockpiled in the corner. And we look at that and go, oh my gosh, my kitchen doesn't look like that. So true. Yeah. Can I say something? Sure. I usually move my hampers. If you guys watch our lives and I'm in a well-lit area, it looks like I have my life together. I have moved all four because I have all four of our family hampers in my bedroom. I scoot them out of the way so you can't see them. They're all in the corner. Every live I do that I'm in that well-lit area. Me too. In fact, that one that I was like... I couldn't do my live downstairs where I usually do in the family room because my son had an appendectomy. He was down there on the couch. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Go All right, move, Damien. I got to do a live. Doing something spiritual here. No. <laughs> I was like, okay. The hampers are never empty. I have a couch in my bedroom at the end of my bed. Jerry thinks that is for his clothing. So before the live, it's like, we got all the clothes, move them, put them in the closet. 
Okay, so, but here's something really interesting. Stress makes us short-sighted. So when we're under a lot of stress, our bodies are wired in such a way that when our fight or flight system is triggered, we just react. We live in this reactionary world. We're just reacting, 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 reacting. We're not thinking noble thoughts about the meaning of life or world peace because we can't. And Satan loves that because each of us have a purpose. And we can't be creative. We can't, what we say, go upstairs in our brain where we have logic and those creative functions where we can be like, you know, Megan is here to do our craft. Well, if she's stuck in fight, flight, or freeze, and she can't think about the fact that, okay, what kind of creative thing can I do with these women? No, she's just like, eat food, wash clothes, take care of children. You know, we just get in this reactionary world. We're reacting, reacting, reacting. And we need to be able to get out of that. So you weren't created just to strive or survive. You were created to thrive. And scientifically, that has been proved. We were not created to have fear as our main basis in our brain. In fact, too much fear, we've seen this in kids from hard places, will damage the brain. It will actually make the cortisol levels in children and us too raise to the point where it's damaging to our body. So there's another proof for the Bible. Science always proves the Bible. That we were actually created for faith. Our brains function better with faith. And faith is the hope of things that we don't, we can't see those things. It's those things that are out there that we believe. We believe that God loves us. Can I give you a bowl of God loves you? No. I can give you a bowl of apples to show you that God loves you. So those things that they are scientific, they're not just some preacher standing up there saying this is the way it is. So, like I said, each of us have a purpose, either through our experience or the desire of our heart. And the way that you find your purpose is what do you feel deeply about what is, it some, what is that one thing that you do that you just totally lose track of time? Like when I am writing, I don't even know what time it is. I'll be writing for three or four hours and not even realize all that time has passed. So when you're in the midst of your purpose, and I used to do the same thing to my kids, poor kids, when I was homeschooling because I just loved to teach. And I would, they would be like, Mom, we've been doing this for two hours. Are we finished yet? You know, that's what you do when you're in the middle of, you can call it a zone. You can call it you were in the middle of your purpose. You are just enjoying it so much. You don't even realize how much time is passing. So, so think about that. So when it comes to my purpose... It's orphans, adoption, foster care, adoptive and foster parents, encouraging women. That's my purpose. Like, this is a new season of my life. I homeschooled for 21 years. All of my kids are finished. I only have one child living at home right now. So that's where I, that's where I park my purpose, and that's where I spend my time. If you're not spending your time where your purpose is, then you're not really walking as far as what I'm saying, walking. You're just kind of standing still and thinking about it and dreaming about it. It's like all those people who come to me and say, well, I wish I could write a book. I've been wanting to write a book for 20 years. And, and I, in my mind, am thinking, if you wanted to write a book for 20 years, you should at least have a sentence down, you know? So if you have a purpose in your heart, then you should be spending some time on that purpose. For instance, I listen to podcasts on writing because I write. You should be filling that part of you up. And if your purpose is like Beth, like in the outreach, you know, you're constantly, I see it all the time, you're constantly reaching out and saying, this is what we need, this is what we're doing, this is the event we're having, and Lori works at the outreach too, and she's always posting. She's using her time for her purpose. They're not just sitting there and saying, 
Well, I wish I could open an outreach. Maybe in 30 years. And sometimes we have a purpose and we can't do exactly that thing. Because when I was homeschooling my kids, I couldn't write a book. But that doesn't mean I taught writing at the, our homeschool co-op, and I did things to continue to educate myself in that way. So you can keep um, working on your purpose. Hey, here's an important thing about purpose, is that just because your neighbor has a purpose, you don't have to have that same purpose. And I've used this example before. Lori makes baby quilts for, like, everybody she knows that's having a baby, and she's very careful and specific and artistic. You know, she'll go and pick out just the right fabrics and make these baby quilts, and they're a wonderful blessing. And I think that she does that because of her past, which i that's her story. I won't tell it. But what if I said, <clears throat> I'm going to do that? First of all, it's going to take me 10 years <laughs> to learn how to make one quilt because that is not my thing. But would I be serving my purpose? No. So every good purpose is not your purpose. You have to find out what, are you, what do you need to thrive in? What is your abundant life? What outreach can you do? So that whole time, if I decided to make the baby quilts, then I would be walking in the wrong direction. Another example I use of this is like, you know, we each have our own little ship. We're on this ship, and here we're going out into the waterway, into the ocean, and we're going to serve our purpose, and we're going to minister to others, and we're going to help others. And then this other ship comes up next to us, and they say, Hey! This is what I'm doing. Do you want to join me? So you get your foot over there, and then you have your foot between your ship and their ship, and the ships are going different directions. <laughs> Guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to be split in half emotionally first because you're going to feel conflicted all the time. And you're going to feel, you might even feel some depression because you're like, well, I've been helping at the nursery, I've been teaching these classes, I've been volunteering here, but I just don't feel fulfilled. Well, maybe you're not filling your purpose. And that's why it takes being self-aware and examining yourself. What is your purpose right at that moment? Okay? And sometimes when you're a young mom, your purpose is at home. And that doesn't mean just because somebody at church said, hey, will you do this, this, and this, that you have to do it. You're going to say, you know, like in Nehemiah, when they're rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem and the families are each rebuilding the wall in front of their own home. And so they're building that wall and they've got their sword there. They're ready for battle. They're building the wall. And Nehemiah says when the naysayers come and are yelling at him and telling him to come down and just giving him a lot of trouble, he says, I cannot come down. I am doing a good work here. And sometimes that's what we have to do to other people. I can't come down. I'm doing a good work right now. I'm doing what God told me to do. Even if it seems strange and foreign and weird to you, this is what God told me to do, and I am going to do it. And yes, people will make fun of you. My own family makes fun of me. We have this family chat, which is like all my brothers and sisters on this big text chat. And we do this like family Friday where we all check in. And this is what I did this week. This is what I'm doing today. And um, my brothers both went to the WVU game last week in South Carolina. They met there. And so obviously they were talking about me because two of them sent me this picture of this homeless guy sitting on the corner with a typewriter, poetry on demand, and they both said, this is what you can do if the whole house doesn't work out. <laughs> so yes, people will make fun of you. And you can just shake it off, or you can laugh with them. So I laughed with them, because there was a really cool typewriter in that picture. <laughs> So even if nobody, if nobody is doing what you feel like you're supposed to do, do it anyway. Do it anyway. Because God might have, I mean, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just giving you an example. 
My husband and I are the only empowered to connect parent and professional trainers in the state of West Virginia. Yeah, that's a little weird. We're the only one. What if we would have waited and said, you know what, we're not going through training until there's at least two other people. We're not doing it. When I got the email to sign up, because you, you don't just get to go to training, you have to fill out all these forms, answer all these questions, and then you have to wait, and I bug the guy to death. I'm like, every day I'm emailing him, did we get in? Did we get in? Did we? And he kept saying, you're just going to have to wait, Kathleen. You're just, did we get in? I was so excited. I knew that was part of my purpose because whenever I got the email to just sign up to see if I could get into the training, I was jumping up and down in my bathroom because it was Sunday morning and I just picked up my phone and got the email. It must have gone through the night before. I was like, yes, yes, I'm doing that. I am doing that. So if you have that reaction, that's probably part of your purpose. <laughs> but if you have the reaction and you read the email and you're like, mm, maybe, well, maybe, uh, I could do that, but I, I, I don't know. Well, then no, don't. If it's not a heck yeah, then it's not a yeah. It needs to be a heck yeah. Like you need to be excited. That doesn't mean that you won't get discouraged or you won't get tired or you won't get frustrated while you're pursuing that purpose. That just means that God gives you that extra oomph because he wants you to keep going. He wants, because there are people out there who need you. You, each one of you specifically, there are people who need you. And if you don't do what you are supposed to do, what about those people? What about those people who need what you have to say or what you have to offer? Then what happens? And I won't get into theology because there are a lot of different lines of theology on that thought line. So, so I like this part too. Where did pool guy go? That's what I like to call him. He went to the temple after he was healed. So he went to the temple, which is church to us, or fellowshipping believers. So whenever something like that happens and you have a miracle and you have, or you just have an epiphany today, like, wait, I need to find out what my purpose is, go talk to other Christians. That doesn't mean you have to listen to everything they say, because they might send you a picture of a homeless guy sitting on a street corner (laughs) typing poems. But that gives you something to bounce it off of. And what I find, I know this is a little strange, the test usually is if someone tells you you're, well, you're crazy, you can't do that, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. If you're telling me that I'm crazy, then it must be something good, because I could not come up with that on my own. And I'm not talking about doing something freaky. I'm talking about something that lines up with the word. Do you think that me collecting women, as my husband calls it, to run the whole house? <laughs> He's like, are you still? Are you getting another woman now? How many women are you going to collect? I don't know. I don't know. However many God tells me to do. I met Jessica because she was my pop Pilates instructor, and. So I'd gone to a couple classes, and God tells me, you're going to ask her to be part of the team. And I'm like, really? (laughs) How am I going to do that? Like, I'm just going to walk up to her after class and say, hey, do you want to be part of my weird team? (laughs) We want to encourage, educate, and equip women everywhere. That's what we want to do. And I did. (laughs) I did. And here she is. So... Um, But what Jesus says to him is, you look wonderful. So I'm going to say to you guys, you look wonderful. If no one's told you that today, you are amazing, you are special, and you look wonderful. And so do my table decorations. (laughs) Got those sticks out of the woods myself. So... um, I don't remember if I put this scripture out. I don't think I did. Ephesians 2.10. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So you can put your name in there. Kathleen is God's handiwork. 
I am created in Christ Jesus to do good works when God has prepared in advance for me to do. Put your name in there. You are created. You are created for a purpose. You weren't a mistake. Nobody in here was a mistake. Because God said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew you. I knit you together. I knit each of you together. When life comes along and slaps us silly, it can feel if God's purpose for us has now been canceled. Canceled. But nothing can stop his purpose for us. Just because your circumstances are hard doesn't mean God's purpose for you has changed. We often think that. I don't know. That's become pretty common in the, the Christian culture. It's like, well, it got really hard. God didn't want me to do this. I give up. That is not the way God works. It is not the way God works at all. Hard work is good. Hard work is good. People often say that one of, one of the, the, the curse is work. Some people say that. If you ever heard say, you know, we, didn't, we wouldn't have to work if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. We'd just be in the garden enjoying. No, work was not part of the curse. Work was part of the original plan. We were all created to work. One of the first things that God did was give Adam some jobs. It's like, hey, all these animals, go name them. Hey, all those plants, you go take care of them. You're in charge. You need to go take care of all this stuff. You're in charge of the garden and the animals. You're in charge of everything. That's a job. That's work. And Adam and Eve had to use every branch of science known to man to do what they did. They weren't just walking around naked doing nothing. They were working. We were created for work. So when things get hard, that doesn't mean that you should quit or that that's not your purpose. In fact, that might be confirmation that you're on the right track, that you're on the right track. So the, the one thing that I'm going to end with is that I had said, if you tell a group of friends that you are blank, fill in the blank, and that you aren't going to do whatever they're doing, because they tell, oh, you got to do this, because we're doing this. We all do the same thing. We all got to wear the same thing. We got to look the same. We got to do our hair the same. No, no. And if they try to redirect you from your purpose, this is the verse I want to end with. You need to listen to your purpose and not theirs. It's okay to act counterculturally. Jesus did. I mean, who on God's big, huge green and blue earth thought that there would be someone that needed to train parents in helping kids who have had trauma in their lives? In a perfect world, we wouldn't need that. But we do need that. And that's one of the things that I do. So <clears throat> there's one more verse. Someone has Romans 12, 1 and 2. If someone says, you are not acting like us, or you are not doing what we are doing, and I'm not talking about doing something weird, I'm talking about doing something that's biblical, and say, well, good. I'm not supposed to be doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. We each have a purpose. We each have a different 
set of purposes depending on our season in life. So what we're going to do, I thank you guys. I guess I gave you guys the same scripture I gave them. And Jeanette's over here like, wait, we have that scripture, so I'm sorry. I make mistakes. Um, We are going to wrap this up. We're so glad you could join us here for the Whole House Podcast. Please subscribe, and if you give us a review, we might pick our favorite and send you a prize. Please remember to like the Whole House Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at the underscore whole underscore house. And please, please sign up with your email on our website, thewholehouse.org, to be notified when new things are happening here at the Whole House. Thanks so much for listening.